In this video, we're going to talk about a very common morphological process in English. It's the process of adding two words together so that the resulting structure means more than just its constituent words. We're talking about compounds. Compounds like a hot dog. Before we look at compounds, let's review uh, the two main types of morphology that we have. You can have derivational morphology and inflectional morphology. In derivational morphology, the affixes change the meaning of the root. For example, in redness, we have the root red and then the suffix ness. And the ness does change the meaning a little bit because red is a color and redness is a characteristic of something. In the word mistreat, we have the root treat, and then the prefix miss um, changes the meaning from positive to negative. Here in baker, we have a derivational suffix, which turns this action, the action of applying heat to bread, into the person who applies heat to bread, baker. So derivational affixes change the meaning of the root. They can also change the grammatical category of the word. For example, they can turn an adjective like red into a noun like redness. They can turn a verb like bake into the noun baker. So these are derivational morphemes. Inflectional morphemes, on the other hand, don't change the meaning of the root. For example, in cats, we have the inflectional suffix s for the plural. And what this does is that it gives you like additional grammatical information. For example, the information that there are many cats, but the kind of creature remains the same. It's always a cat. The meaning has not changed. Likewise, in baked, the, pa the uh, inflectional suffix here is telling you that the action is in the past tense, but the action is the same. It's applying heat to bread. In baking, likewise, what uh, the suffix is giving us is information on how long the action is taking, but the action itself is the same. Bread, heat. So derivational morphology changes the meaning of the root. Inflectional morphology does not. It adds grammatical information. Derivational morphemes have many restrictions on what kind of roots they can uh, attach themselves to. For example, uh, not every morpheme can join every word. For example, we have the suffix ness, which can join an adjective like red to create redness. But what if we have the adjective sane and we try to say sanness? That is not a word. So ness can only join with certain types of roots. On the other hand, we have another derivational suffix, iti, which also means like the abstract quality of an adjective. So if we have the adjective sane, we could say sanity. But we cannot set redity for the quality of being red. So this morpheme also has a restriction on where it can attach to. Um, spoiler alert, itty only attaches to uh, roots that came from French and Latin. And ness only attaches to uh, roots that came from uh, Old English and Germanic languages. Because they have restrictions, they're less productive, meaning that there are fewer words that could possibly take the uh, suffix ness. On the other hand, with inflectional uh, morphemes, there's very few restrictions. So most nouns can take a plural, and most nouns will take the plural z, which we described a couple of videos ago. For example, in cats, dogs, turtles, and horses, all of them can take the same plural morpheme. Because so many words can take this morpheme, inflectional morphemes tend to be very productive, as opposed to derivational ones. Finally, derivational morphemes tend to live closer to the root, whereas inflectional morphemes live farther away. The word internship, for example, has two suffixes. There's the root intern, there's a derivational suffix ship, which changes the person who does a job to the job itself, internship. And then at the edge of the word, we have the S for the plural, internships. So the inflectional morphemes live at the edges of the word. 
nationalize has one root and three suffixes. It has the root nation. It has the derivational suffix al, which turns nation into national. So it changes a noun into an adjective. And then we have the derivational suffix is, which turns national into nationalize. So it changes this adjective into a verb. And only after we're done with the derivational morphemes do we have the inflectional s, which tells you that it's the someone is doing it in the third person. It's he, she, they. And this inflectional morpheme lives farther away from the root. So this, these are two kinds of morphemes of morphology that we have: derivational and inflectional. And we're going to look at a specific kind of derivational process called compounding, creating compounds. We say that it's derivational because we take two words and then the combination of the two words means something else. For example, a hot dog is not, it's not a dog and it is not necessarily a thing that's hot. You can have a cold hot dog. So the combination of the two words creates a new meaning. Sunglasses are a specific kind of sunglasses. Sky blue is a specific kind of blue, so the meaning has changed. Brett tin is only a specific kind of tin. And a football is, again, a specific kind of ball. There's something funny about these structures. How many words are there in these things? Because sometimes the, uh, they come together and sometimes there's a space between them. Believe it or not, this is a very active area of research because no one's 100% sure of whether these are stored as two words in your brain or as one word in your brain. For now, what I want you to, to notice is that regardless of, of uh, whether you put a space in there or not, which is usually there because of just orthographic tradition, these two words are bound into a structure that ends up meaning something else. We're going to call those compounds. Compounds in English have this very interesting telaway. Please try to pronounce these two uh, phrases, words. The one on the left is the food. The one on the right is a, hot, is a dog in a warm environment. So please try to say those words out loud and try to figure out which of the two is uh, more prominent for each of them. Please pause the video. All right. The first one is a hot dog. The second one is a hot dog. Compounds in English tend to have a stress on the first word, whereas separ actual separate words like a dog that is hot tend to be stressed on the noun, on the second element. This is a hot dog and this is a hot dog. For example, you could live in a white house, but none of you live in the white house with the stress in the first one. Compounds have heads, which are like the main word in the structure. For example, a greenhouse and a doghouse are kinds of houses. Footballs and basketballs are a kind of ball. And sunglasses are a kind of glasses. So these are called the head of the compound. And there's two types of compounds. The first one is called endocentric because the head describes the same kind of object as the whole compound. These are the ones we saw before. A greenhouse is indeed a kind of house. A dark room is a kind of room. A, uh, some sunshine is a kind of shine. And small talk is indeed a kind of talk. However, in exocentric compounds, the, the structural head, so the second word, doesn't really refer to the same object as the whole thing. So a redhead is not a type of head, a hot dog is not a kind of dog, a laptop is not a kind of top. So we're going to study more about this in a week for semantics, but there must be some third thing floating around in your brain that tells you that a redhead refers to a kind of person. But for now, what I want you to know is that sometimes the head refers to the same structure the as the whole compound, and sometimes it doesn't. By the way, Compounds are extremely common in English, but they don't, they're not as common in every language. For example, in Spanish, is, it's very difficult to find a compound structure with uh, this kind of morphology, two words just stuck together. 
So we have two main types of morphology, derivational and inflectional, and there's a special kind of derivational process called compounds or compounding. They're very common in English. They are the addition of two words so that you can get a new meaning from the two words being together. Compounds usually have heads, which in English is the second word. And sometimes the head refers to the same thing as the whole compound. We're going to call that an endocentric compound. And sometimes it doesn't. A redhead is not a kind of head. We're going to call that an exocentric compound.